Hello, everybody. My name is Stephen Checkaway, and today I'm going to be telling you about some of my work with, uh, that was done in collaboration with a, a huge cast of co-authors spanning five different universities on dual EC and TLS implementations. So the dual elliptic curve deterministic random bit generator is rather a mouthful that means that it is a pseudo-random number generator. And this random number generator was designed by the NSA and subsequently standardized by ANSI, ISO, and NIST. Shortly after the standard was published, uh, Shumo and Ferguson, researchers at Microsoft, demonstrated that there was a potential backdoor in dual EC, but uh, people thought, well, no one's actually using this, so let's not really pay that much attention to it. However, recently, Edward Snowden revealed, in, uh, revealed last year Project Bull Run, which had as one of its goals the weakening of commercial cryptography. And subsequently, Reuters reported that the NSA paid RSA $10 million to make dual EC the default PRNG in their TLS libraries. And so that got us really excited. Uh, we wanted to know, we wanted to be able to answer the question, if we assume that there is a backdoor in TLS, is it exploitable and how hard is it to exploit in a TLS connection? But I want to be clear that what we're not doing in this work is we're not trying to come up with a probability that a backdoor exists, and we're definitely not trying to recover the backdoor's secret key. We can't do that. So first, how does a PRNG work? If you've never thought about it, basically, it's pretty straightforward. You have a, an initial state, which I'm calling S0 here, to which you apply a pair of functions, F and G. So F of S0 gives you a new state, S1. G of S0 gives you a new output, R1. And this process repeats, and you get, uh, you get new random numbers. And the, the key thing here is you must keep the state secret. So the, you don't want to ever leak the state, because if you leak the state, then you can recover all future outputs. So how does a backdoor work in a PRNG? Well, the basic idea is that if you have knowledge of the secret key, then you can start with the output, say, R2, apply your secret knowledge, and recover the state S2. And then, as I mentioned, once you have S2, you have all future outputs. All right, so that's sort of in general. How about dual EC? How does it work? Well, the EC stands for elliptic curve, so the first thing we have to do is talk about elliptic curves. You don't need to know all the ins and outs. The most important parts are that a point on an elliptic curve is an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate, which in this case are just 32-bit integers. And the fundamental thing that you can do with elliptic curves is you can take points on the curve, and you can add them together, and you can get a new point. And the operation that dual EC is going to be using is called scalar multiplication. So given an integer n and a point p, produce the point np. And this is very easy to compute. You just add p to itself a bunch of times, n times, and you have it. And I should note that the opposite operation, starting with p and np, uh, it's difficult to compute n. So with that, let's take a look at dual EC. It starts just like our abstract PRNG with a state S0, which is a 32-byte state. And the first thing that you do to generate some output is you take S0 and you multiply it by this fixed point P. So P is fixed in the, the dual EC standard. Then you take the X coordinate, and that gives you a 32-byte new state, S1. To get some output, you take S1 and you multiply it by another fixed point Q, take the X coordinate, and that gives you R1. And then finally, you don't use all of R1. Instead, you take the least significant 30 bytes of R1, and that forms the initial part of your output. Then this process continues. You take S1, multiply it by P, take the X coordinate to get S2. Take S2, multiply it by Q, take the X coordinate to get R2, take the least significant bytes of R2, that gives you the next piece of output, and so on. So what Shumo and Ferguson noticed was that if an attacker knows an integer d, such that p is the scalar multiple of d and q, then 
from knowing just the output, you can recover the internal state of the generator. And the way this works is you start by taking the initial part of your output and you treat that as the least significant bytes of R1. Uh, then you have to guess the two most significant bytes of R1 and multiply by D, essentially. So uh, by multiplying by D, you end up with the state S2, from which you can compute R2, and now you can compare the least significant bytes of R2 to the output. If they don't match, that means that your first two bytes were, uh, that you guessed were incorrect, so you just go and you try a new guess, you try a new two-byte value. However, if the bytes match, then that means that the attacker has successfully recovered S2, and from this point on can know all of the future outputs that are gonna be generated by this random number generator. So let's take a step back from the details and see what's required to actually perform this attack. And it's, it's pretty simple. You need, the attacker needs two pieces of information in addition to that secret number D. The attacker needs to see most of R1, which forms the initial part of the output. So say at least 28 bytes of R1. And second, the attacker needs to have some public function of enough of R2 to be able to validate the choice. So in a couple of slides, we'll see an example of this in TLS. So speaking of TLS, how does this work? Well, recall that when a client connects to a server, the first thing that happens is it, during the handshake, is it sends a message to the server that contains a 28-byte random value called client random. The server responds with its own 28-byte random value, server random, in addition to a 32-byte session ID and the, and the Diffie-Hellman public key for the server. So that would be XP here. So X is the private key, XP is the public key. The client then responds with its own public key. And the key point here is that if an attacker is able to recover either X or Y, then the attacker can decrypt the entire session. So these values have to remain secret. So what we did was we took a look at four common TLS libraries that implement uh, dual EC. So we looked at RSA's BeSafe libraries, Share for Java and Share for C and C++. We looked at Microsoft's S Channel and we looked at OpenSSL FIPS, which amusingly was actually broken uh, and so we had to apply a small fix to make it work, but see the papers for the paper for details on that. So all of these support dual EC as a random number generator. Of course, the RSA libraries support it as the default choice. So let's take a look to see how the basic Shumo and Ferguson attack can be used to recover the, the Diffie-Hellman secret key in the share for Java library. So here, R1, R2, and R3 are the, the three output uh, blocks that we get from dual EC. And we see that the first thing that the server does is it generates a server random, which consists of 28 bytes. Then it generates a 32-byte secret key and then multiplies that by that point P to get a public key. What the attacker sees is just the server random and the public key. And so his task is to first guess the most significant two bytes and the least significant two bytes of R1, run the attack, and now uh, gets to compute X and then ultimately compute XP. And if XP matches the Diffie-Hellman public key for the server, then the attacker knows that he has recovered X and can now decrypt the entire TLS connection. In fact, it's a little worse than that because the next thing that the, the library does is it generates a nonce for a DSA or an EC DSA signature. And since the attacker now has the internal state of the generator, the attacker gets the nonce. And it's well known that if you have the nonce and a signature, then you can recover the key used to sign the, or to produce the signature. So what this means is that after seeing a single TLS connection, an attacker would be able, to, an active attacker would be able to successfully impersonate the server. All right, so this is all in theory. How do we go about checking that this actually works? Well, the first thing we have to do is we need to generate our, a new point Q, so Q prime here. This is one that we know its relationship to P. Then we need to go through the four libraries that we examined and we need to replace Q with our Q prime. 
including some tables of multiples of Q which appear for efficiency in several libraries. Now to do this, to perform this replacement, we have to do a moderate amount of reverse engineering of the BSafe libraries in S channel. Of course, for OpenSSL, it's open source. We just change the source code, pretty simple. Now, once we have gone through this task and made these modifications, the attack is actually pretty easy to validate. All we have to do is capture some network traces using TCP dump and then run our attack on it to recover the, the TLS master secret and decrypt. All right, so we looked at four different libraries and one thing that's interesting is that although these are ostensibly implementing the same protocol, TLS, and the same random number generator, dually C, the implementer has a whole bunch of different choices that she can make. So for TLS, she has the option of generating the server random session ID and Diffie-Hellman keys in different orders, or she can generate them all at once as one sort of big block of randomness. We know we're gonna need this many bytes. Let's just generate that and carve it up. Uh, she gets to decide if the session ID is gonna be random or some deterministic function of something else or uh, basically anything that she wants. When it comes to dual EC, she has some options as well. So dual EC generates output in 30 block, 30 byte blocks. So what happens when you make a call for 28 bytes? What are you gonna do with the two bytes that are left over? You can either just drop them on the floor or you can cache them and use it to satisfy the next request. Uh, turns out that dual EC also has a provision allowing you to hash in additional input into the, uh, the internal state on each call to the generator and this actually makes the attack quite a bit harder depending on what this additional input is. And finally, there are two different versions of this standard. So in 2007, NIST published a slightly updated version that has a small tweak. Uh, the published reason for the tweak was to provide backtracking resistance. Uh, but what we noticed was that actually that this tweak makes the attack work in one particular case involving additional input where it didn't work before in the 2006 version. Now it may come as, as no surprise that if you have all of these different choices, that implementers would in fact make different choices when they implemented it, and, and you would be absolutely right. So even RSA uh, was implementing two libraries that are pretty similar, one in Java and one in C, but they made uh, vastly different choices. So for example, the version in C uh, has output caching, and it chooses to generate uh, the server random and session ID as like a single chunk, whereas the Java version doesn't even have a random session ID and just generates each of these individually. Notice that Microsoft's S channel actually implements the 2006 version of the standard, which doesn't really affect us very much, but it's, it's kind of interesting. It appears that, they, that this was a bug. Uh, that's not confirmed, just looking at the, the disassembly. Uh, and then OpenSSL fix, this is our one line fix to, to OpenSSL to make it work, uses additional input in the form of the current time in both seconds and microseconds, as well as a monotonically increasing counter and a process ID. So each call to generate these values get hashed into the state. And what's surprising is that this makes a big difference, that the various implementation choices have a huge uh, difference on runtime for our attack. So you can see in the, the rightmost column how long it took on a, a four node 16 CPU cluster. Uh, see the paper for details of that. But um, basically what you notice is that the more bytes of output, or the more bytes per session, which are the, the output bytes from the random number generator from Dual C that appear on the wire, the easier the attack is, except in uh, S channel actually where we came up with two different attacks but that's kind of a, it was a weird one. So again, see the paper for, for details on that. So the conclusions that we can draw from this are that, that it, yes, it is possible to exploit a pseudo random number generator that has a backdoor, but it really depends on three things. One, the design of the PRNG. So of course it has to have a backdoor to be exploitable, uh, but also, the, the basic attack depended on how many bytes of R1 that got put on the output. So it takes 30 of the 32 bytes if they had, 
used fewer bytes, it would have been a much harder attack. If they'd used more bytes, it would have been a much easier attack. It depends in a really strong way on the protocol design. So you need to have, the attacker to perform the attack needs to be able to see output from the generator on the wire. So we need some raw bytes or something close to the raw bytes on the wire itself. And as we just saw, the implementation choices make a huge, huge difference in terms of the runtime of the attack. So some of them were very fast. You could do it in seconds on a laptop. Others required uh, an extensive computation on a, a cluster to be able to, to, a small cluster, but still, uh, and a significant amount of computation to decrypt the session. And so one thing that's interesting to note here is that it really helps to have a hand in all three of these aspects. So we know that the NSA designed dual EC, and we know that the NSA co-authored some TLS extensions, which if, they're, if they get used, make the attack much, much easier to exploit because they, they put more random bits on the wire. And in fact, we know that the NSA paid RSA a big pile of money to make it the default generator, thus making it possible to attack. So at this point, since I have some time left, uh, I want to show a little demo of this. So uh, I like this quote from Dickie George where he claims that our work doesn't work. So let's see here. Um, so this is gonna be the share for C and C++ library. It's a, a Windows library, so I'm gonna run the server in Wine. This is the sample code that comes with the server. Basically, what it does is it, re it reads one line of input, and then it echoes a, a fixed response, request received. And now, let's start TCP dump up, make a connection with OpenSSL, and I can type whatever I want. Send that, and then I get a response. Uh, okay, so let's kill TCP dump. And try to decrypt this. So I'm not sure how long this is going to take. Ah, okay. So it took about three and a half seconds to decrypt it. So with that, thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. <laughs>